Here we go again, another inflammatory study, and it takes the media landscape by storm. One could say they never skip a beat. Oh, we're talking about this study, pinning omega-3s as a heart problem. I've already been contacted by plenty of people in the community to cover it with claims of omega-3 cause heart attacks. Run for the hills. Uh, <laughs> insert a classic Iron Maiden right here. So what does this study actually say? In truth, the media headlines aren't too far off this time. The researchers performed a prospective study, meaning that they're looking ahead, where they interviewed hundreds of thousands of participants over several years to gain some insight on their baseline habits, diets, and so on. Then, a little over 10 years later, they assessed how many people ended up with atrial fibrillation, which is a type of incorrect rhythm in the top section of your heart. We'll leave it simple, although cardiologists across the land are scoffing at the simplicity. They also assessed if people had heart disease events like heart attacks, as well as assessing stroke and mortality. They excluded people who already showed signs of diagnosis of heart disease at baseline. They were able to segment people into two groups, omega-3 supplement consumers and non-consumers, and those are the two groups that we're comparing. So the question is, over 10 plus years, is there more, less, or no change in heart disease risk from consuming omega-3 supplements? Here's the data. Hey, hey, don't fall asleep. This is important. I realize it's a bunch of numbers, but I'll explain where the fear is coming from as quickly as humanly possible. Okay, the data again. Keep in mind, I'm highlighting certain data, and if you'd like to see it all, the study reference is linked in the description. You see the baseline to atrial fibrillation. Of over 400,000 people, there were 18,367 people who developed atrial fibrillation when they did not have it before, so that's called baseline. But the real question is, was that more or less than the people who did not supplement with omega-3s? For that, we can focus on the hazard ratio here. And if it's above one, it's generally considered increased risk, assuming that it's confirmed by the statistical analysis, the p-value here needs to be below 0.05 to indicate a likely statistical difference. So the answer is yes there was an increased risk of atrial fibrillation with omega-3 supplementation. If your eyes flow down one row, you'll notice that this was also the case for stroke risk, but that's not the end of the story. The reality is these researchers broke things up by progression of disease, which means that they not only looked at baseline individuals to see if they progressed to atrial fibrillation, but once people had atrial fibrillation, did they have heart problems beyond this arrhythmia? Did they have higher risk of heart failure and death? If we pop open the data again and we focus on the transition from atrial fibrillation to heart attack, that's myocardial infarction or even death, we see that both are statistically significant, but fascinatingly, the results indicate an association with reduced risk from omega-3 supplementation. Are you confused? Okay, let's get into some speculation as to why the results are the way that they are, including a bit of physiology. This is physionic after all. Allow me to first point out that this study is associative, and there are a few aspects that are pretty important before we get into the physiology, which I promise is wildly cool. But when is physiology really not? First, while the researchers did ask these people if they're taking omega-3 supplements at the baseline measure, remember the interviews and the questionnaires, however, they didn't continue to check if the participants were still consuming omega-3s 10 years later. I'm not saying that I don't believe that most people were still taking omega-3s because with such massive sample sizes, even if you have a few thousand people that drop off the supplement for whatever reason, it likely doesn't affect the results because the result is based on hundreds of thousands. That said, the strength of the study would be increased significantly if they had been able to query if people are still on omega-3 supplements every year or two to verify. 
With that many participants, it probably wasn't feasible though, but it's a weakness of the study nonetheless. The opposite is also true. People not on omega-3s may have jumped on, but again, the amount of people needed to make a meaningful impact is, well, in statistics, is huge. Actually, I'll be covering more details on this study, including the age effects, uh, fish consumption, blood pressure, statin use, and much more in my extended version of this video. If you're interested in more details other than the basic takeaways, I would love to see you in the Physionic Insiders. It's actually there that I learned about this study because the community is smaller and I'm able to interact more there. Anyway, an additional consideration is the reminder that this is an associative study. Yes, it has many adjustments included in the statistical modeling, but regardless, it's still associative. That said, the researchers did point out that this is, wait for it, not the only study that has shown omega-3s may cause atrial fibrillation. That's right. Some randomized controlled trials have indicated an increased risk as well. Now, I'm going to be looking into this in far more depth, broadening the scope of the investigation to encompass all cardiovascular disease and omega-3, so I'm going to hold off on making any definitive statements yet, but the researchers offer some possibilities as to why some studies, including theirs, indicates a fibrillation risk, while other studies indicate it protects against cardiovascular disease. Actually, this study does as well. So what's going on? Okay, now let's get into the physiology because it offers some clues as to why we see these divergent effects. The researchers point out that there is mechanistic research indicating too much omega-3 fat can change the structure of the cell membrane, thereby inhibiting the ability for the cell to function properly. Should I go into specifics? If you said no in your head or out loud, I'm gonna have to ask you to leave because we're about to nerd out. Then we'll get into the takeaways. If we zoom into your heart and we zoom into your heart cells called cardiomyocytes, that cell has a membrane and that membrane, among many other things that it does, regulates the amount of ions, that sodium and potassium, but others as well, that enter and exit the cell. It creates a gradient with the outside of the cell filled with more positive ions than the inside of the cell, which then makes the inside of the cell more negative. Why am I telling you this? Because I want you to suffer. Or because this gradient is the key to why your heart beats. When the heart cell is activated to beat, simplistically explained, the positive ions outside of the cell rush into the cell, making it much more positive. This is called depolarization. We won't go into all the dynamics, but just know that your cardiomyocyte has depolarized, so it needs to return to its baseline state, the negative state, to be able to contract again and contribute to your heartbeat, thereby pumping blood. It does that through these sodium-potassium pumps that eject the positive ions back out of the membrane. Okay, enough background. Where do omega-3 fats come in? Your membrane is made up of fats and cholesterols primarily, and the composition of that membrane determines how effective it is, meaning how well it allows proteins built into the membrane to function. One of those proteins is the sodium-potassium pump. If there are too many omega-3s making up the membrane, it disrupts the ability for the pump to function correctly, thereby impeding the cell's ability to depolarize and readjust to baseline correctly. This can lead to an arrhythmia. Now, before you go on saying, well, that settles it, you're going to avoid all omega-3s, you may want to know that there's also research at lower doses that indicates the opposite effect, improved cell membrane function and the pump's function. So this all to say, are these effects possibly dose dependent? Unfortunately, the study that we just went over didn't measure omega-3 dose, but before you rip my head off in the comments for leading you down a wild goose chase, the researchers did reference one randomized controlled trial that showed no fibrillation effect of omega-3 supplementation when consumed around 840 milligrams per day. So, Taking all that data so far into consideration, this study confirms the benefit of omega-3s on many of the major cardiovascular outcomes, but confirms previous data that omega-3s may raise a risk, a small amount of atrial fibrillation and even less of stroke. Like I said, I'll be doing one of my 
multi-study analyses on this topic. So I'll be able to offer much more secure answers once I've taken a few weeks to dive into the totality of the evidence. But for right now, I'm not overly worried by these study results. If you care about this topic, which I imagine that you would considering that you listened to my face up to this point, my face can also be found in this related topic right here.